Should a Christian vote? Oh boy. Controversial sermon. Boy, I never preach on controversial issues. I mean, it's just something. I always avoid controversy. I only preach those topics that make people feel warm and fuzzy inside, right? You ought to know better if you've seen this. I've been watching many videos here at this ministry. I don't really shy away from controversy. I don't really go looking for it. It just kind of seems to find me. <laughs> Turn your, in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now what is the standard for a King James Bible believing Christian? Whenever anybody tells you something that you should be doing this or you should be thinking that way or whatever else, the first thing that you do is you come to your King James Bible and you say, does this word appear in the Bible? And I would like to point out the fact that the word vote is not in the Bible. So, well, that doesn't... No, just hold on. Voting is not in the Bible. You're never going to see anybody voting for any secular politician. That's not in there. Is the concept of voting in the King James Bible. We're going to look about that in the study today. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Okay, we're going to see quite a few things in this passage here, so let's keep our eyes open. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And I can't wait for it to be tested, you know, the fact of Jesus ruling uh, and getting the proper respect that he deserves in due time. That's going to be the millennial kingdom, I believe, the second coming going into the the millennial kingdom for the judgment of the nations that you see in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, Jesus is going to finally get what's truly rightfully his. But uh, we're not there yet, so we still have to deal with some secular politicians. So what's our reaction supposed to be? Well, it says there, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority. Okay. We are to pray for all those in authority. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to talk about voting and, and rights and constitutional law versus, you know, republic versus democracy and all this other stuff, all these different forms of law, communism versus capitalism and this dictatorship versus oligarchy and all these different forms of man-made government, I'm going to tell you the way, the true way of having power in a country is not through political maneuverings, <laughs> okay? The power, real political power, comes from Christians understanding their place in the political scheme. And what is it? We have power through prayer. And I'm going to show you that the real power that we do have is Christians. But notice the second thing there. So we're supposed to pray for those in authority, all in authority doesn't matter who gets voted in. I mean, do Christians still have rights today in America? Yes. And yet we have one of the most evil presidents that's ever been, Obama. He's a very evil man. And yet it's funny because he's a Muslim, obviously a Muslim. He you know, has no uh, need for the Lord, and yet he tries to act like he's a Christian. Why? Because there's still power here with Bible-believing Christians. He still has to kind of toe the line a little bit. And don't tell me it's part of some old big Illuminati conspiracy and blah, blah, all this other stuff. People give way too much credit to the Illuminati and even the Jesuits and things like that. That stuff's there. It's real. They're the ones that are uh, in control of a lot of things. But I'll tell you what, we as Christians have a lot of power. Real power. Spiritual power. We'll talk about that with this study. But notice the second part there, verse 2. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You can live a quiet and peaceable life if you're praying for the political leaders. Um, for the most part, we've had a real quiet and peaceable life. Yeah, there's spiritual attack and things, spiritual warfare that goes on, but uh, I haven't had any police officers or SWAT raids or 
whatever else coming here to kick down my door because I got King James Bibles around or something. I've had confrontations with police and, and they go away and it's a friendly thing. I've told police officers, you know, that uh, right to their faces, I respect what you do, you know, and I'll defend your authority as a police officer. We'll see that in a little bit too here in this study. But uh, I've lived a pretty quiet and peaceable life in spite of the fact that we have the worst president ever in American history other than maybe FDR. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I think, was a bit worse than Obama. He did some really bad things. But the point is, um, you can have a bad leader, and if you're praying and you're staying in the Word of God, uh, you can still lead a pretty, pretty quiet and peaceable life. But notice it says there, in all godliness and honesty. When the opposite of that is, if you're living a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty because you're praying for the leaders, if the leaders get so corrupt, you can't be honest with them anymore. I mean, would you have told the truth to Hitler's troops as they're coming around looking for Jews? You're hiding a family of Jews in your home and the Nazis come knock on your door and they say, you know, the SS or the, uh, the I forget what some of the other, um, the, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of the different units of Nazi soldiers. But the point is, these guys come and they knock on your door. Are you going to say to them, uh, yes, I, I, you know, I have to be honest with you because I'm a Christian. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, we do have some Jews here. We're hiding them out. You know, they're upstairs. Go on and get them. Of course not. You're going to lie to them. You're going to say, no, I don't, there's no Jews here. You know, the Gestapo. Excuse me. <laughs> Couldn't think there for a minute. I was thinking Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe, but no, no, Gestapo. So sometimes you can't be honest with politicians if they get really, really crooked. Again, we're going to see that in a little bit, too. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and of God our Savior, verse 3, uh, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth, upholding truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. You put this book in a prominent place in any society, that country is going to do well. But when you close this King James Bible and you remove it from a, the prominent place that it's supposed to have in a country, uh, things start to go to pieces. So what can we as Christians do to preserve our freedom? Hmm? Um, become private citizens, become uh, constitutional lawyers and constitutional this and that and stuff like this. Um, I'm here to tell you that stuff is, it's just paper. I mean, when it comes right down to it, if you get a criminal coming up to you and they say, give me all your money, you can hold up a little paper and say, wait a second. It says stealing is wrong. They don't care. We have to fight on a spiritual level. And the way you fight on a spiritual level is by keeping God's word in a prominent place. God wants all men to come unto the knowledge of the truth. King James Bible. Verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Oh, no, well, see, this was wrong. Paul again, you know, he's, Paul doesn't always, he's not always really up to date with modern times and things like this, kind of archaic here, you know, because everybody knows that there's other mediators between God and men, the civil government. No, that's not what it says. And no, that's not what we believe. God has a specific place for the civil government, government that takes care of affairs of state and protecting the borders and, you know, whatever else. God has a place for that. We're going to see that here in this study. But when it comes to certain rights between you and God, the only mediator between you and God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a pope, not a governor, not a president, not senate, not congress, not whoever. Jesus Christ is our king. And he alone is the one that gives us, truly gives us our rights. Go next to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to, be, or he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. This is Jesus' trial here talking about verse 8 when Pilate therefore heard that saying he was the more afraid 
and went again on, into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Now here's the interesting thing about this. Look at verse 10. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? <laughs> Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Look at Jesus' answer here. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Um, whoever gets into office, they have no power at all, except it were given them from the Lord. And I uh, did a sermon in 2012 with the last election, and I predicted accurately uh, who would win the presidential election in 2012. And it came to pass exactly as I said. And you know who it's going to be again? I'm going to tell you who's going to win. You ready? Because I did it back in 2012. It came out perfectly. I'm going to tell you who it is again. You want to know? Whoever's worse for this, or whoever will do the worst job of messing this country up. Why? Because the people are wicked. God is going to bring punishment to this nation. Why on earth would God restore America and bring a, make America great again? Why? Would it turn people more towards the Lord if they prospered more? You know what the message would be to the lost world out there if God prospered America? The message would be, we're right with God. Wouldn't it? Whoever is going to do the worst job as president is the one that's going to get in. God's judgment is upon America. And don't tell me that we can have any say in that thing depending on who we vote for. All right? I've stopped falling for that stuff years and years ago. Whoever gets in they are not going to be able to do one thing against the body of Christ unless God gives them permission. So why worry about it? Why get so drawn into the political world, into the all the debate stuff going back and forth? And it's a, it's a show, people. I mean, come on. I mean, you look at them, the friends, they're friends. Trump's and the Clintons, they're friends. Trump has said so. You know, it's acting. He's an actor. Had his own show, The Apprentice. He did. How do you think the guy got to the level of money that he has? By being honest and hardworking? We'll get back to that. And again, I'm not endorsing Hillary. We'll talk more about that too. Go next to Romans chapter 13. The infamous Romans 13 that the patriots get all worked up about, you know, and stuff. And Romans 13 does not mean submission, total submission to the government. Well, that depends on what kind of government we have. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. It says here, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. All right? Um, very interesting. But what did we just read back there in John chapter 19? We read about how that Jesus said, you wouldn't have any power at all. Thou canst have no power at all except it were given thee from above. So whatever the rulers are doing, it's because God is allowing it. I mean, put that thing into perspective, brethren. They can't take another breath if God doesn't give them permission. How powerful is your God? What, what's going to happen if Hillary Clinton gets elected? God's going to tell her what to do. See, the whole thing here is, with Christians getting all drawn into this thing, you know what it tells me? It tells me you're watching television or watching the coverage on the Internet. You're getting suckered in by their propaganda, by their brainwashing, their programs. You're falling for it. Oh, no, brother and mother, no, I said, don't even talk to me about it. You are watching mainstream media mind control. That's why you're so worked up 
oh, we just can't let Hillary in. And Donald Trump, he says some good stuff. I mean, yes, he's had some problems in the past, but he, he's going to be the best pet. He's the lesser of two evils. And you're watching the propaganda. They're lying to you. I showed it. They're both agents of the Vatican. Trump, Jesuit trained. Hillary's wife, Bill. I didn't say that. Well, maybe, maybe his wife. Her husband, Bill, Georgetown University, Jesuit. Hillary's vice presidential candidate, Jesuit. They're just rubbing it right in your face. Crazy. But let's continue reading here. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. The Bible clearly defines the kind of rulers that we're supposed to submit ourselves to. They're not a terror to evil. They're, they reward you for being good. But it's ironic because you say, well, okay, brother, but uh, so we should submit ourselves only then to the good rulers. Well, you can disobey bad rulers too. And ironically, they'll actually reward you for being good. Huh? How about Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, I see that too. You know, people they say, you know, God used Nebuchadnezzar. Well, God can use anybody, all right? And you had Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's, you know, basically his uh, staff, essentially. You know, the cabinet, the, the people that worked with him. And what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He made him a great ruler and gave him lots of riches. Why? Because Daniel went along. He was a good Republican or Democrat or whatever it was back then. No, because he stood up against him. He wouldn't go along with it. Same with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hmm. So, if you do right, it doesn't really matter what the politician is. It doesn't really matter who gets into the office. You keep serving the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, what they want is exactly what Trump said. We need to start fighting against this anti-Catholic bias and be concerned about a world community and things like this. Hmm. It's funny because Hillary didn't say a thing about uh, anti-Catholic bias, and they said, well, she made derogatory people, and her staff made derogatory remarks about the Catholics and things like this. Then why would they have her there? <laughs> you know? It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Well, let's continue. Verse 5. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake, for for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Okay. Uh, one more verse here. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Again, if you're showing love, through your ministry, if you're showing, you know, and, you, and, you know, love and judgment too, by the way. You can tell Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholics that their system is wicked and that they're going to hell. You know, that's perfectly fine. That's showing love. Uh, love is not just going along with what everybody else believes. That's not love. All right. And if we are doing that as Christians, the Lord's going to protect you, regardless of who gets into office. All right. Turn next to Ephesians chapter 6. You know, I want to make a point here too as we're turning to Ephesians 6. And that is, I find it interesting that uh, people that get all worked up about, you know, politics and things like this and who's running what and who's this and who's that. Um, it's kind of ironic because Roman Catholicism is the one who believes in spiritual and temporal. You know, they, the swords are both spiritual and temporal. They believe they control both realms. So it's a Catholic church that's always concerned about getting their people into authority. 
And, you know, I'll grant you, yeah, if they, you know, whoever gets in, it doesn't matter, Trump or Hillary, whoever gets in, it's going to be bad. Uh, there's going to be more persecution coming if the Lord allows it. Okay? Again, the Lord can stop anything from happening. I believe that 9-11, uh, the attacks there, were supposed to be a lot worse. But God stopped it. You know, they had to abort the mission. I believe that that's what the whole thing of the shooting down of Flight 93 over there in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Well, down there now. I'm used to being in Pennsylvania, saying over there. Down in Pennsylvania, I believe that they shot that plane down. Whole other story. But the point is they had to abort the mission. I think it was going to be a lot worse. That could have been the, the total takeover of America. God stopped it. I think if there was some stuff under Obama that he would have liked to have taken over the country. But God stopped him. And whoever gets in, God can stop them too. But let me show you another interesting thing here. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Hmm. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to vote. Oh, I didn't say, maybe I should say to vote Republican. You know, and I was a registered Republican, you know, years and years ago too, by the way, so... Don't get on my case and say, oh, you sound like a Democrat or something. I was never a Democrat. Whatever. But you see, it's uh, in the evil day there. We are to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. What are we standing with? The Word of God. Mm -hmm. But notice verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You mean the rulers of the darkness of this world are not flesh and blood people? That's what our text says. Um, then why does it matter who we vote for? Hmm? You say, well, then you should think that Christians should never vote and should never have voted. No, I don't believe that way. I believe back when there was more of a, a free country here in America, when the government wasn't totally bought and paid for, I believe that, yeah, you could have voted back in those years. Back, you know, maybe in the 1800s or something like that. Yeah, I think that there was probably some real elections back then. I, you know, this, this uh, dinner that they had where all these, you know, Trump and Hillary were there speaking and stuff like this. This dinner that they had, and this guy that you know, it's what uh, was what was the name of that dinner? Al Smith dinner. Al Smith dinner. Okay, I forgot. The Al Smith dinner. This guy Al Smith, the original one, way back in the early 1900s, um, he was a Roman Catholic, and he wanted to run for the office of president, and the people voted him down because he's a Roman Catholic. See, anytime you have a Roman Catholic running for political office here in America, you get a big problem because they're dual citizens. And their allegiance is first to the Vatican. They're a citizen of Rome. They're a citizen of America. And so they're not going to be loyal to America when Rome tells them what to do. So the people back then had enough sense to say, whoa, hold on, we're voting against that guy. I'm not voting for him, this Al Smith guy. He's a Catholic. He's a papist. And we let that guy get in, it's going to be back to Rome. Hmm. You say, well, then we should do that today. Uh, yeah, but they're both servants of Rome. The election is rigged. What do you do? Hmm. It's kind of a problem. But if you think to yourself that Hillary Clinton can get into power or Trump get into power and that they can pass laws in this country without being told what to do by the spiritual wickedness in high places, the powers, the real powers that run this world. If you think that they can do things contrary to what their orders are from on high, uh, you're quite deceived. 
And that's why for a Christian, when you see, hey, things are rigged, the game, the election here is rigged, there's nothing that can be done, right? Uh, the politics today in America is basically the, a front for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the big pharma uh, is controlling the elections. And uh, they're, they're the ones that are given most of the money. And, and of course, big pharma is tied in with like Monsanto and things like that. Monsanto is behind all the GMO, all the GE crops and all this other stuff. Um, it's, it's huge multinational corporations that control the political system here in America. So why even vote for either person? It doesn't make any sense. And you see, when you see the thing is, when the, the game is rigged, so to speak, then you say, okay, we need to go above that. We need to go up to the spiritual level. Because that's where the real control is at anyhow. See, in the past, I would have said, yeah, you know, don't vote for this Al Smith guy. Vote for somebody else. That's not in the back pocket of the room. You know, go back beyond that. Christians getting into, you know, political like a governor or, or a mayor of a city or whatever else. You go back into the 1800s, yeah, there's probably, I'm sure that there was some of that and it was probably a very good thing. But now? Now I just don't agree with it. Go back to Proverbs chapter 14. You know, people say, well, what about Jehovah's Witnesses? What about, you know, you're, you're acting like a Jehovah's Witness. I saw that in one of the comments on the video. You're acting like a Jehovah's Witness saying you shouldn't vote. Well, I say you shouldn't vote uh, because the elections are rigged. You're wasting your time. That's why. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Again, who is God going to allow to be elected? Well, whoever does the worst job of messing up America. Simple. And, you know, and again, think about the politics here in America. We've had the same people in politics now for, what, 20, 30 years? They're not getting voted out. You get some new people in and some, you know, whatever else. People go, well, Trump's new. Trump's an actor. And uh, Interesting that uh, who was the last actor, professional actor, that we had as a president here in America? That would be Ronald Reagan. What did Ronald Reagan do in terms of Catholicism? Well, that's right. He was the very first president to allow the Pope onto the shores of America. And I believe that you know other presidents before him were in the back pocket of the Vatican. But the point is, they waited till Ronald Reagan was in. See. Because Ronald Reagan comes in and he reads from the King James Bible and he acts like he's a Christian and, and has the nice voice and the, and the gentle tone and the kind of grandfatherly way. And George Bush Sr., you know, and he's there and wouldn't be prudent, you know, and all this stuff. And he's just, I'm just kind of a dumb man from Texas and I'm just not really all that smart. Never mind that they named the CIA building after him and he was involved in the whole Kennedy cover-up and stuff like this, the... Uh, uh, see, I, my mind's just <laughs> escaping me right now. The cover-up that happened after the JFK assassination. But the point is, last time we had an actor in for president, the Catholic Church got all kinds of power. Why? Because the actor can lull the people to sleep, particularly the Bible-believing Christians. Bible-believing Christians out there are going to go to sleep if Trump gets elected. That's why I said in my video, I hope Hillary gets elected. Because then Bible-believing Christians can stay awake. And we can pray and we can fall down on our knees and go, God, please keep this evil witch away from us. You know, please, Lord. We want to lead a, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's what we want. But America ceased to be a righteous nation. We had good standards in the past. Those standards are being thrown out. Just like a, a, a book and they're just pages being ripped out and thrown away. That's what's happening to the morality of this country. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 2. It says here, For the transgression of a land many are the princes thereof, but by a man of understanding and knowledge the state thereof shall be prolonged. 
brethren, we can't fix America. Okay, America's gone. I mean, even from, you just totally eliminate the spiritual, just get that out of there, which I don't recommend, but let's just say, even if you went with just a purely secular uh, standpoint, you can't bring a nation back after it's $20 trillion in debt. All right, nearly impossible. America, with all the problems and the crime and, and just the total moral degeneracy and bankruptcy and just, it just, this country is gone. This country is finished. The industry, gone. Uh, how do you bring back America? You know, they're talking about World War III, Russia, you know, we're like that close to this thing happening. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, all these big countries getting together, Turkey, you know, and uh, they're going to fight against America. Well, it's interesting because if you study what happened back with World War II, there were factories, clothing factories, that were converted into making weapons for, for uh, World War II. The Singer Sewing Machine Company was making, uh, you know, artillery and things like that. They just say, okay, stop making sewing machines. We got to start making bombs and bullets. How are we going to do that? All the industry went over to China. Very few things are even made in America anymore. A couple guys with small little backyard machine shops and stuff making some good products yet here in, a, in, in this country, but they aren't going to be able to supply the military with the kind of munitions and things that it takes to wage war against big countries like Russia and China. America's going down. Well, then what can we do? What can we do, Brother Brian? Well, by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. Oh, now I think that Trump could get in and he could bring things back to way. It's not going to happen, brethren. Not going to happen. We're going to talk about that as we continue here. But it isn't going to happen. I don't, you know, why are Christians so deceived by this man? The only hope that we have, uh, I know I've said this before. I got this from uh, Peter Ruckman. And he said, when you study military terminology and military you know, uh, different types of warfare. Um, there's something called a rear guard action. A rear guard action is the enemy has broken through the lines and you're trying to get your troops out as you're retreating. And the rear guard is the one that are there. They're guarding, they're firing, they're fighting off the enemy that's way outnumbering them. But all our job is, as the rear guard, we're just trying to slow down the enemy so that our weaker troops can retreat. That's all we're doing right now in America and most other countries too, by the way, while there's, where there's Bible-believing Christians. The uh, Sodomites, the, the Roman Catholics, the Muslims, the, all these different uh, wicked groups that hate Jesus Christ, uh, you know, they're coming. And all we can do as Christians is we can have understanding and knowledge from the Word of God and we can prolong the state. I mean, it's, it's, it is a complete miracle to me uh, how, um, how this country of America has not totally collapsed financially yet. I mean, it should have happened a long time ago. What's going on? There's people being saved by Bible-believing ministries. People's lives are being changed. That's where the fight is at. That's how we're going to make this thing last a little bit longer. And only that. But now finally, I want to talk about why I will not be voting for Donald Trump. You know, and, and people say, well, then brother, why don't you vote for a libertarian or some kind of deal like this? There are no choices for a Bible-believing Christian. All right. I mean, even if you get the most awesome liberty-upholding constitutional lawyer, blah, 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 whatever, and he gets in, he ain't going to change a thing, all right? <laughs> Again, how can you have God bring prosperity to a nation that's so obviously wicked? It isn't going to happen. But this is why I will not be voting for Donald Trump. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. You need to think about this as a Christian. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and in a, and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Who's coming in the future? The son of perdition? 
Hmm. Do you think that uh, Donald Trump has ever been in, engaged into uh, foolish and hurtful lusts? How many marriages has he gone through? Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. You see somebody that has love of money, you say, eh, nope, sorry, I'm going the other way. I don't want anything to do with you. Flee these things. Not go out and say, well, he is the lesser of two evils, therefore I'll sign my name. I know it's digital and things, but I'm going to sign my name that I'm voting for a man that the Bible condemns. What he's doing, how he's got to his position of power. It's pretty bad. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's our job. Not, uh, well, let's, let's vote him in, let's vote Donald Trump in so we can have him prolong the state thereof. You know, what we read back there in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 2, that's a reference to saved people, not a world politician. If Trump was a man of understanding and knowledge, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4 verse 12 through 18. What if the bad person, what if the worst of the two, you know, whatever that is, what if Hillary gets elected? What if, what if Trump gets in and, and he's a, you know, just totally takes the Catholic persecution of Christians to a whole new level? What if, what if? Let's see about that. First Peter 4 verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as, an, as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Key verse. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God among the saved people. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, what, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Our job as Christians is to witness to the lost, but also to judge professing Christianity. Because as we judge professing Christianity, it's purifying the body of Christ. And you get some guy comes in and he goes, actually, the Nestle's text is better. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. The Nestle's text comes from the Vatican. Jesuit Cardinal, Car uh, the, the Jesuit Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini worked on that, you know, team of editors there, the board of editors. You take your Jesuit Nestle's text and you get out of here. We use the King James Bible. Somebody comes along, they say, the rapture was created in 1830 by John Nelson. You say, what? Well, 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 you're a liar. That's not true. It was taught by people before then. But even if, you know, whatever with John Nelson Darby, it's what does the Bible say? You get out. You see, people come in, they say, well, the dispensationalism is a heresy created by Jesuits. Oh, come on, please. Give me a break. That's ridiculous. What does the Bible teach? You know, and on and on and on. These people are coming in and they're lying they're trying to draw Christians away. They're trying to split up the body of Christ and all these different little warring factors and factions and things like this. We need to unite. Not under the banner of Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. We need to unite under King Jesus. 
you know, there was a great uh, man in the political structure of England back right after the King James Bible was printed. Uh, he was actually alive during the printing process or the uh, translation process. And his name was Oliver Cromwell. That's who I named my son after. And uh, he had a slogan that he said, and I believe it's inscribed on his grave. It says, Christ, not man, is king. You see, he understood that the one mediator between God and men is Christ Jesus. And if you keep Jesus Christ as your king and you say, my vote goes to Jesus Christ, it matters not who's in authority because my king, Jesus Christ, will tell them what to do. And if we continue, if we, as a body of Christ, purify the body of Christ, we, we have that judgment at the house of God and we say, you're non-dispensational? Out. You're, you believe in this easy believism stuff? Out you go. You're a post-tribber? Out you go. You don't believe in eternal security? Out you go. You're not a King James Bible believer? Out you go. Judgment at the house of God. That's why the Jesuits are working so hard right now to infiltrate our numbers and get in and split us up. Because spiritually speaking, we have the power to prolong the state of this country. But the more of us fall away and start to fall for the lies and things, and, and I mean, think of the hypocrisy. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he stands before the throne accusing us day and night. Think of the accusations that the devil can bring against Christians because of their support for Donald Trump. Look at the Christians down there, Lord. You, you mean to tell me you're going to bless these people with peace and prosperity? You think it's your, why would you bless those people? They're standing up for Donald Trump. He clearly serves, you know, me, the devil would say. He served me for years and years and years. That's why I've rewarded him with all these, this wealth and all these harlots that he marries. He's a Jesuit. And yet you have Christians militantly fighting for him and defending the guy. You better think about that. You want God's uh, hand of protection upon us here in America? Then what needs to be done is Christians need to say, I'll have no part of these rigged elections. It's not the lesser of two evils. It's two evils. All right? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to fall for this thing. Hey, Roman Catholicism, the Vatican, Pope, the Jesuits order, order, and all that other stuff, we know what you're doing. We know that you've taken over the government of this country, and the only way that we can fight you at this point in time is to expose you and to bring judgment upon the house of God that's left, the rear guard that's prolonging the state right now, that's keeping the freedom intact, not the Constitution. The First Amendment is not keeping your rights as a Christian. The Second Amendment is not giving you the right to bear arms and to protect yourself. Those rights come from God. I'm not worried about politicians taking away my Second Amendment, Second Amendment rights. You know why? Because I don't have any. I have no Second Amendment rights. I have God-given rights. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that I'm to provide for my own, especially they for my own house. And if I don't, I've denied the faith and I'm worse than an infidel. I have a God-given right and duty to protect my wife and son. And the best, most advantageous way to do that is with a firearm right now. Like it or not, that's the truth. They said, well, well Brother Brian, they, they made a law. They wrote a law that says that you can't have a gun anymore. Okay, well, the Bible says I can. The Bible says I'm supposed to protect my wife and son. Who am I going to follow? Well, that depends on uh, who your king is. My king is Jesus. My king says, that's the way it's going to be. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, your majesty. My king says, sodomy is an abomination. Oh, but, but brother, they pass hate crime laws and you can't dare speak against the sodomites anymore. Sorry, I'm going to do it. Not because I hate them, but because I love them. And I'm going to tell them the truth. What you're doing is an abomination in God's sight. You can get saved. If you're a sodomite, you can come to the Lord and you can be saved and you can get out of that filthy life of perversion. You're never going to find joy. You're never going to find happiness. 
That's what it's about. Finally, let's go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. The angel of the Lord there, I believe, Paul later on says, the angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve. I believe it's a reference to Jesus Christ. Big study there, but the point is, Jesus would bust somebody out of prison, a bunch of Christians, and Jesus breaks him out of prison? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's kind of sad. I thought about this different times, and I thought, you know, I think that there would actually be Christians today that would say, uh, Lord, you know, that really wasn't right for you to break me out of prison. I mean, that's not going through the proper channels of, of the political world and things. I'm going to have to go back into jail, Lord, and I'm going to have to sort this thing out because I have to submit myself to the laws of the land. And, and you know, I know you want me to preach there, but I was told I wasn't supposed to. So maybe I can go and I can get a lawyer and we can get this thing cleared up because I'll just tell them about my constitutional rights and I get a permit to go and preach down there. That way it'll be legal. Okay, and I won't have this to deal with every time. <laughs> you know that there would be Christians that would do that. They would argue with the Lord about that. You see, God's laws usurp man's laws. As long as man's laws line up with God's laws, there's no problem. But when man comes in and steps in and says, hey, you're not allowed to preach. Sorry. King Jesus said, I can, and said, I must. Hey, you're not allowed to have that King James Bible. Sorry, King Jesus said, I can. Hey, you're not allowed to speak against sodomy. My King Jesus said, I can. Hey, you're not allowed to this. You're not allowed to that. Well, I'm sorry. The Bible says, I can. And any ruler that has any common sense is going to understand that a Bible-believing Christian is the best citizen that, they're, they get, that they can have, the best subject in their uh, you know, political realm or in their, in their country. We're the best. But let's continue. Let's see what happens here. Verse 21, And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. <laughs> they were worried. Man, what if other people hear about this? Let's continue. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. They're out there. <laughs> then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. So you mean to tell me they come and they pass a law and they say to these Christians, You're not allowed to preach into jail with you. The Lord breaks them out of prison and says, go back and preach. They go back and preach. And now the politicians come and they say, um, excuse me, could you please come over here? We'd like, we'd like to talk to you. Just a little word. of just come here. Why? They feared the people. Who had true political power in that situation? The politicians or the Christians? The Christians. You know why? Because they had a king and his king was named Jesus. The king was named Jesus. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? 
If you've been led astray and you think to yourself, oh boy, we just got to get Trump in. And what if, what if Hillary gets in? And, oh boy. You need to repent. That's why I said in my other study, you're not right with God. All right. I didn't say you're lost. Okay. You can be saved and you can be out of fellowship. You know, again, I assume that people think, you know, that they understand what I'm trying to say. All right, and sometimes I'm not very clear, so let me make it clear. You can be saved, and when you are not right with God, that means you're out of fellowship. doesn't mean that you've lost your salvation or that you were never saved or whatever. You know, some people have the question because they're really, really radical, whatever. But you can be a Christian, and you can fall for this political stuff. I watched the first debate. I had some things to do the one night, and I thought, well, I looked, and it was like, oh, debate, presidential debate live coming up. And it's like, I was like, oh, okay, I'll watch it, see what happens. You know, and I'm watching it, and I'm just like, this thing, they are appealing, they're using Trump. Trump is acting his part, Hillary's acting her part. It's all an act. And they're both speaking to two different groups of people and, and telling them what they want to hear. I mean, look at how many things Obama said that he was going to do, and he didn't do it. He lied time and time and time and time again. And Trump's going to be better? And even if Trump got in there and said, you know what, I'm going to change everything, it's still the higher powers, the spiritual powers that are not flesh and blood that are going to tell him what to do. But let's continue. Verse 27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name, and behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Yeah, that washes away your sins there, politician. It's not how they meant it, but it's kind of funny how it came out. Verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Hmm. We ought to obey God rather than men. You see, brethren, that's what it's really all about. I used to get caught up in all this political stuff and everything else, you know, the big Ron Paul revolution and all this. My wife actually spoke at an event, you know, for Ron Paul as a military veteran, you know, and she's speaking for Ron Paul, advocating for Ron Paul and stuff. And, you know, it was right around the time she first got saved. And, and uh, so she made that mistake and she wrote to me and I was like, I think you really need to consider a few things. And we talked about it and stuff. And she was just like, I'm done. You know, she she was a delegate and things like this. And she like dropped her delegate status. And I mean, she just, and she was just like, it's a scam. I see it now. But you see, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that be in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can get drawn away sometimes, brethren. The love of the world gets a little bit strong and you start to fall for the propaganda and you start to fall for the lies of a con man like Donald Trump. And you start to listen to the guy and you start to say, I think he's actually a good man. I think he could actually turn America around. What if he could make America great again and he could bring back our industry and, and we could have... It, uh... You're doing it, aren't you? Yeah. I fell for it back years and years ago. Yeah. But I repented of it since then. And I realized that the power that we have as Christians that we read about right here, the political leaders came and they feared the people because the people were listening to the Christians because the Christians were demonstrating power. I mean, can you imagine that? Here you have these early Christians and the, they're preaching the Word of God and people are going, look at this crazies and stuff like this and all of a sudden here comes the soldiers and they're like oh boy okay get away go 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 you know and it's like you know okay hands on the back of your heads well they didn't have guns but you know i guess swords you know and and the christians are going okay all right you know getting taken into the prison and stuff and the people go these crazy nuts they got they got taken away they, they, some of what they were saying was kind of interesting but not even 24 hours later the people were there just, you know, milling around, you know, the streets, whatever. And all of a sudden they hear those voices. How do those Christians get out of that prison? Whoa. And somebody comes over and they say, the Lord broke them out. And the Christians say, 
Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ just busted us out of that prison back there. And why? So we can preach the gospel to you people. Our King is Jesus. Jesus Christ will save you. He got us out of the prison. He can get you out of the prison of your sin. And they start preaching and those people go, there's some power there. Wow. And they were so much for those Christians that they would literally have stoned to death those politicians if they had come and tried the same thing on them again. Tried to take the apostles by force. The people would have stoned the politicians. The politicians understood the power of the Christians. Why? Because they were united in their purpose. Because they said we ought to obey God rather than men. You can tell us not to preach the book politicians and we aren't going to listen to you we want to be good law-abiding citizens but don't push us don't say you're not allowed to preach that there's not a thing wrong with what we preach and teach we teach people to clean up their lives isn't that what you want if you're a politician should be we have power as Christians, not, for, not because we vote Republican or because we oppose the Democrat Party candidate and things like this. We have power as Christians because of what we do for the Lord. So that's going to be it. Election Day is coming up. Here. I think this coming week or something like that, just a couple days away, I think four days now, I think today's the fourth, so I think this sermon's probably going to be out the fifth, so you'll have a few days to think about these things and to pray about it. You say, well, Brother Brian, what are you going to be doing on Election Day? Praying? I'm going to be praying that the Lord opens the eyes of the Christians. I really honestly don't care who gets elected. Uh, like I said, in some ways I wish Hillary would get elected because then Christians would stay awake. I don't know who's going to get elected. They're going to make a big circus of it. There could be some violence involved and stuff like that. People fighting and things over it and rioting and whatever else. Uh, they might kick martial law in or Lord only knows. But I, my hope and prayer is that you as a Christian will, if you've been drawn into this whole thing, that you'll, that you'll pray about it. And you'll say, Lord, what do you want? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I don't care who gets elected, and I don't care what laws are passed. I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Simple. You say, well, Brian, they might outlaw the Bible. I don't care. I'm going to preach the book. I know my, where my rights come from. So that is going to be it. Please pray about these things. Thank you for watching.